The panel three is about politics, and the subtitle is From Observation to Engagement. Politics, we define it as the art of living together, had become more than a topic in architecture practice. The necessary of the so understanding of the social and political content of design challenges beyond statistics is transforming architectural practice into a service to humanity and the quality of everyday life in all aspects and scales. We have invited three young colleagues to and ask them about the use of politics as an instrument of critical practice that finally tries to build a better living together world. Atelier Masoni, Mariam Camara will be around. Founded Mariam Camara founded Atelier Masomi in 2014 in Naimei. Her work is guided by the belief that architects have an important role to play in thinking spaces that have the power to elevate, dignify, and provide better quality of life. Through her practice, Marianne aims to discover innovative ways of doing so while maintaining an intimate dialogue between architecture, people, and context. Kim Brickland and Aaron Roberts are the directors of Edition Office, an architecture practice based in Melbourne, Australia from 2008. Through the execution of, its build work, of their built work and research, Edition Office displays its engaged, engaged practice understood as a series of simultaneous negotiations between modifiers, people and place, and conditioning objects, buildings, and pre-existences. I'm sorry to communicate that Elizabeth Añaño is founder of Cotidiano, that perhaps you have seen her name in the posters, finally couldn't attend this symposium. So we have these two offices for the panel moderated by Anna Pujaner. Anna Pujaner is an associate professor of professional practice at Columbia GSAP and coordinator of the Core One Architectural Studies. She's also co-founder of Mayo, an architectural and research <laughs> practice established in Barcelona. Actually, uh, the survival of the first edition of Constructing Practice uh, Symposium. They were a part of that uh, uh, panel at that time. Her work has a deep implication in the idea of living together through the developing of new models of collective housing. And her research work, especially the kitchenless city, relates to the review of social, economic, and political implications of the domestic domain. So let me please uh, invite Atelier Masomi to come to the stage, Marianne Kamara with all of you. And thank you so much for coming over and thank you for having me. This is quite a treat. Um, and I'm really excited to, to talk about these, um, this topic, this subject matter um, specifically because it's, it's truly, I mean, not just this particular aspect of politics, but all the other topics that have been talked about um, throughout the symposium, whether it's sustainability, or technology, those are all things that are an integral part of um, the work that we do um, in Niger. As one was saying, um, I have a firm um, based in Niger in West Africa, um, but I split my time between the US um, and there, so I spend half, half the year there and half the year um, here. But, um, but the entire firm is actually based in Africa and the whole operation is over there. Um, and I thought it would be really interesting to more have a conversation about how we work, um, what, is it, what is it that drives us, what's the process, and what's the context in which we work, and how that informs the work that we do. Just to give you kind of an idea of where Niger is, because I know that no one knows, <laughs> and I don't take it personally. Um, even in other parts of Africa, when I meet people, and they're like, oh, where are you from? I'm from Niger. It's like, where's that? So it's not Nigeria, so I guess let's put that out of, you know, get that out of the way. Um, it's surrounded by all these other countries, and in, in a way, um, one particularity of, of um, the country is that it's not kind of what you imagine Africa to be, I think, in general, where you imagine some kind of tropical, you know, place, you know, lush and nature and things like that. Um, it's a desert country, actually. So in, in that way, it has more in common with a country like Morocco or Algeria than it, it has um, a country like, you know, Ghana or, you know, or South Africa or, or, or Kenya or something like that. Um, and also because of its proximity um, and it being in the Sahara Desert, 
it also means that it's, it's a Muslim country. It's a 95% Muslim country. And those, those are all the things that, as part of that context, affect, affect the work that we do and the kinds of problems or the kinds of um, issues that we tackle on a daily basis. This is basically where I grew up. <laughs> Um, I grew up in a city really near um, this area, um, in the Sahara Desert. Um, it was a mining town. And I think that's probably the single most determining um, aspect of what my architecture ended up being, and um, both the, um, the preoccupations um, surrounding the, the building process and um, the quality of um, the, the projects, I guess, that we develop. Um, our practice is is in the city of Niamey, and it's it's though though it looks a little green here, it's really you really feel um, the desert. Actually, this is kind of the, during the rainy season, so it feels a bit um, a bit greener. Um, but it's also um, a river city, and that also matters. And we'll talk about that um, later on, which helps it be a bit more green. But it doesn't shield us from um, things like. Um, climate change and sandstorms and things like that that actually come through that again affect the work that we do. Um, this, is, this is a very typical um, kind of city shot of um, the streets of Niamey. And the firm is just very small and we, there are four of us actually, and from kind of all over the country, but um, the, the, entire, um, the entire firm for now is from Niger. And we work on the various type of projects. Essentially, our projects seem, the, the, pro, the project types are kind of disjointed. We don't focus on just residential or on just cultural projects. We do a bit of everything. And what our practice have in common is that we actually really involve ourselves or, or concern ourselves with um, the local history, the local context, the local materials, trying to figure out, um, you know, unearthing its history in a way, trying to figure out what is it that's there in the place that we can then take, learn from, and then transform and usher into a future, essentially. These are some of the, um, this is the firm actually, basically. <laughs> this is everybody who, who works there. This is on one of the, pro a, pro a project that we had just completed um, in a village seven hours away from, from Niamey. And this is basically, this image shows everything that we have available. Essentially, one of the biggest challenges of practicing where we practice and deciding to really be all about the context and all about what is available there is that we really have access to just three materials. It's earth, some cement, and metal. Because again, it's a desert country, that means that we don't use wood. Um, termites are a big problem. And that's the challenge for every project is to try to figure out how to actually take these three materials and every time wonder, well, what else can I make with this? And so to give you a bit of um, context on me, um, I wasn't always an architect. I, I was trained as a software developer and I practice um, and I wrote software for many, many years. I wanted to be an architect since I was 12 or 13 years old. But coming from Niger, I just didn't think that it was reasonable to pursue a field that would be creative because you know it's not something that necessarily you know pay the bills or didn't feel like what people around would think of as having a successful life or having made it somehow and it just seemed almost um wrong in a country where so many people struggle um and everybody was just trying to get ahead and so i went in in that direction but Many years later, and that's where the politics aspect come, come into place, I started realizing the kind of impact actually architecture has on our everyday life. The fact that it actually is one of the main determinants in the way we feel about ourselves, because it's the environment that gives us a reflection back of what is it that we think we are and who we are. It's one of the strongest markers of cultural identity, really. And when I started thinking about it that way, it gave me kind of this extra push that I needed to go back and make that switch. You know, um, went back and did the three-year program and all that and came back out as an architect. And one of the first projects I worked on, and this was actually um, during my thesis, that was my first test of trying to figure out, well, how do you actually study in a country like the US and then directly go and apply all of that um, in a completely different context. 
granted a context that I'm very familiar with, but a different context nonetheless. Nothing in you know the classes that we had, even when it was situated elsewhere, nothing was really tackling the kinds of problems or the kind of issues that I was seeing in my home country. And so I, I did a bunch of research um, for, for almost a year actually and had um, several um, conversations um, with young people throughout the city. And one of the things that, that came out was that I realized that one thing that we do in a place where there's very little available in terms of public space, in terms of um, all kinds of amenity that you can think of, um, is that we actually use the street as the main common space. It's not really a public space, it's like free for all. And so the street is used for commerce, it's used for housing, it's used for you know, celebrating weddings, it's used for just sitting in front of your house and you know, drinking tea and playing cards with your friends. But one thing that I quickly realized was that when I was growing up, actually, we didn't have a space. If you see in these images, um, all of the people in those photos are men. And so I started realizing that actually this, these streets might be available for all these different things, but actually it was not really well seen for a young woman specifically to be seen just sitting, for example, like those young men in front of the house. That's something, that's somewhere that you would never see a girl there because you immediately destroy your reputation. And so I started wondering, and I had this conversation with young girls in Niger in terms of, well, what is it exactly actually that we do? How did we circumvent this? And I quickly started remembering that what we did was what these two young women are doing in that I would go to a friend's house and then she would walk me home. And we live in the same neighborhood, and so we just keep walking each other back and forth to each other's houses. And it was just kind of like this endless circuit, and it could last two hours. And that was basically our private you know, space. Because when you're at home, maybe there are too many people and you have secrets to share, you're a teenager, you, know, you don't want everybody to hear what you have to say. Um, and it was just kind of this, this place that you had. And I called the project Mobile Loitering because essentially it was without realizing a tactic um, that we developed that allowed us to, to loiter just like everybody else. But because we were on the, on the move, um, it wasn't suspicious. And so we, worked with these young people um, from high schools, you know, who did a bunch of drawings, you know, a bunch of discussions, you know, and things like that. And kind of a program came out of all of that, where we started talking about, oops, oops. No. Um, we started talking about, I don't know what's happening, <laughs> sorry. I have a slide missing. Um, we started talking about the kinds of things that they would do, how they felt about being outside, and it was very split and very divided where some of them were saying that, well, actually you have no business being outside, outside of you know, just going to school and coming back home. If there's something that you want to learn about the world and about you know, life, you can just watch TV, for example. Or, you know, other, but other people were very adamant about you know, really wanting to be part of the city, really wanting to experience things and you know, people watch and you know, make comments about what they see, you know, whatever, just like everybody else would do. Um, and so throughout those conversations, um, we devised this project um, where they would be, um, that would take into account spaces they currently um, use. So for example, they, they told us about the fact that they, they go to the, stadium a lot for sports and then they go to the museum a lot because our museum is kind of like this open um, this series of pavilions really and a landscape and so they would just keep walking around and socialize in that way and so it ended up producing this project where um, there was this itinerary basically that would allow this lo mobile loitering um, that would join these two main spaces that they use already, create a path um, from the two, but then also make sure that it englobes a maximum number of um, schools so that, for example, they could find themselves on that path on the way home from school or um, studying in group is something that we do a lot. So whether they're going to school or somewhere else, what they would study in group, they might actually be part of this itinerary and it can be part of you know, a study break or something like that you know, as they're going, going around. And so the itinerary was shaped by taking account in schools, kind of pushing it towards um, more lower income neighborhoods because they actually are the most conservative part of the cities and so the, those are the part of the cities where girls are more likely to be, you know, um, 
to be asked to stay home and not go anywhere. Um, but most importantly, it was really also about peppering that itinerary with a series of spaces and a series of um, program, basically, that could also serve as a destination. Instead of just the destination being the stadium or the museum, then it became you know, um, about creating spaces that are shaded, for example, just so that they would be really enjoyable to walk through. Because again, I, I'll remind you, if I haven't said it enough, that we're a desert country, so it's 45 degrees you know, um, almost year round, 40 to 45 degrees Celsius, sorry, um, year round. And um, then it kind of became about creating these different program spaces, you know, for studying, you know, for example, along the street. But by co-opting this approach that we have already used in the street for different other kind of programs, mostly for economic programs, um, or just shacks for selling things, you know, and looking at that as an opportunity rather than um, looking at that kind of tactic as something that debases the city, which is often the case in, in African cities where what is quote unquote called the informal economy or you know, other, other kinds of um, enterprising you know, that, that crops up along the street is always fought against and always destroyed. But I thought there was actually something really interesting there in terms of really using amenities that were just there to start doing something out of it and start using it actually as a language for urban design and for architecture to make actually even other kinds of things and amplifying it. And so really it was about you know, creating all these different destinations that would be acceptable for the young women themselves, not so much for their families, but for themselves to not feel as though they were necessarily being incredibly transgressive, which is not really productive because that, that's the kind of effect that doesn't last. But it was really about them feeling safe and feeling that they could go around you know, in, and partake in these different activities um, without anybody being suspicious of their presence there. And so that was a project that, in the end, um, triggered really my practice um, and triggered the kind of work that we do now. And after working on that project, I actually just decided to move to Niger and not take um, a job at all not in the US or get any kind of experience in the US, which I don't recommend. But, but that's, that's what I, do. I don't recommend that, honestly, because I know the students there, I'm not advocating you do this. Um, but this is what I did, because essentially, you know, since, as I was saying, because it was my second career, I really had a f sense of urgency, and I felt like I, was, or I had already wasted so much time. I was well into my 30s when, you know, when this happened, and I was just thinking, no, I have no time to waste. I don't have time to gather up IDP points and, you know, and work three years or four years or whatever and do the exams or whatever. I didn't want to do it. Um, and I, was, I just really, really only wanted to work in this, these kinds of contexts. So there's also the thing about you know, um, going back to school when you're much older. You know, it gives you kind of a greater, greater sense of clarity, in a way, in terms of the things that you want you know, out of life. But the question was, well, how do you go about and do it? I can't just come out of school you know, and, and, and do this. Um, essentially, what that ended up being was um, I was fortunate enough to associate myself with three other architects who were really, you know, um, had more experience than I did, which was really important. And um, we tackled this project um, in Niamey, which was a housing project that was looking at issues of, again, because everything we do looks at issues of. So um, issues of density, as you can see in this image, um, it's a very flat city. Everything is kind of on one level um, and very spread out and sprawled. And so we started thinking about ways um, of, very, of densifying without necessarily you know, going up in height and creating apartment complex or anything like that because it's not, you know, I find that going up, you know, starting towers really is only makes sense in cities like here or cities where there's like, you know, at least 10 million people in there. You know, if, if that's not what you're facing, um, it's not always necessary. And so it was about really going back and analyzing the way you will live culturally, you know, um, the economic pressures and all of those different things, um, the need for outside space, the need for shaded space and all of that, and create something of a puzzle almost, you know, this dense um, proposal that would allow um, for better use of space. 
um, while still maintaining a sense of community, a sense of you know belonging, a sense of really feeling that actually all of your different cultural behaviors or you know cultural needs are met in the space that you live in, especially in a city which um, used to be an ex colony where actually a lot of the architecture is just pale copies of Western architecture that have nothing to do really with the way people actually live their lives. So it ends up becoming this exercise of constantly circumventing the architecture and going around you know, the, what the architecture is in order to live your life, which makes no sense. And so it was really about also materials, local materials, in order to make sure that the costs are kept down. People routinely save for 10 years, 12 years, in order to be able to build a home. Mostly because also there's kind of this, this understanding that in order to be modern and to be civilized, you have to build a home made out of cement and made out of concrete. Um, but again, in a, in a climate like this one, basically you, we're just creating a bunch of um, ovens to live in because concrete retains heat. And because also we're building houses, again, that are made out, out of Western model of building houses, which actually are focused on retaining heat. So all of that put together, um, we ended up creating this project where um, it was about you know light and shadow and shade and cooling and passive cooling, um, using these different materials. Whoa, about affordability. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what that was. <laughs> about affordability, about actually being able to um, be public um, in the sense that, uh, if you remember one of the first images that I showed of people being outside on the street or sitting you know, on the street, this is a behavior that's really important actually in the culture. It's called fada. And fada is kind of, um, uh, it's, 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 almost, it's almost like you know, a salon or something, you know, where you just go, come in and you, you're friends and you discuss politics and you discuss all kinds of different things. And it's really, really important and you see it everywhere in residential streets where young people or older people also are just sitting um, in front of the house and the house is actually both an extension of where you live but it's also an extension of the public realm. And so that kind of in between, even though the current houses that are built don't really recognize it, it's always, you know, people just drag chairs, you know, and bring, you know, in front of um, their compound wall to sit anyway. So that behavior is not going away, so why not incorporate it in the architecture? It doesn't really make sense to just ignore it. So it looks like I'm running out of time, actually. So I'm going to just run through a bunch of um, um, images real quick. But, um, but essentially, this is the project that led me to, to create Atelier Masumi and just really realize, okay, I think there's something there. The project was widely successful. It was really well received. And it, it, it kind of started this thing that we were trying to get at of actually proving that no, a contemporariness or modernity has nothing to do with either looking Western or looking, you know, like something came out of California or came out of, you know, whatever. Um, we can actually take whatever is available, the limited means that are available, and make something that is of the time and make something that also projects itself in, in, in the future. And so that became really the ethos of, um, of the firm. And that is the thing that really um, follows us um, throughout um, our different projects. This is, for example, um, this cultural complex that we, that we built in um, a village in Niger where um, we brought together um, an old mosque that was built by a mason um, that everybody forgot about, but it turns out won an Aga Khan Prize for architecture for a very similar mosque just one hour away from this village. And it was going to be destroyed. And they, they just wanted to create a cement replica of it in its place, just slightly bigger, because it would last longer. Because the, the reality was that um, the society was changing so much that people forgot how to take care of these kinds of buildings. And so it just became too much of a headache. And so what we did was we really, um, so number one, we, we pointed out the fact that this is actually um, a cultural um, uh, marker, I guess, you know, um, for the country. And in terms of our architecture, this was really a precious building. Um, it had just so many things that even we could learn from. And, but the issue was, well, OK, well, what are we going to do? Because we're not going to maintain it. We don't know how to work with this anymore. Um, and on top of that, it's too small um, for, for the village now. They needed a bigger mosque. 
And so again, you know, just like for the mobile learning project, we went through a series of different um, workshops and discussions with uh, different stakeholders um, in the village, with children, you know, et cetera. And the idea was to keep the old mosque, um, but to turn it into a library, actually, um, and create a new mosque next to it. Essentially, it was supposed to be two different projects. The library would be the only one miles and miles and miles around. There's really no, even, even the, the village itself actually provides the only school for six different villages that come there. And so the library was, is really kind of a one of a kind thing that there's, there's no such thing anywhere around. So that, that's kind of what triggered um, the need and um, the desire to do something like that. But they wanted two different projects where we would have a library and then a wall and then you know a mosque because obviously the two things are not the same. And obviously also there was just a lot that had to be done in terms of convincing to turn a mosque into a library. So we encounter all kinds of you know issues of you know of accusations of blasphemy. You know how dare you do something like this in in a sacred um, um, environment which was actually a wonderful um, conversation because then it allowed us to really actually talk about religion, to bring out the Quran and talk about you know, the importance of knowledge in the, in the religion and the fact that, in, it, number one, there's nothing in the book that says that you cannot turn a mosque into something else. And number two, the pursuit of knowledge is a precept that's actually incredibly important it's written black and white in the religion. So it was also a great kind of teaching moment and a, a great exchange moment that just, you know, once you actually show that it says so in the book, that you're supposed to go and find knowledge as far as away as Asia, that's what it says, um, literally, um, then how can you say that we cannot make a library? And so the second thing was um, for us to, I'm just gonna slip through these, <laughs> um, to figure out how to do it, um, it was we were able to find the original masons um, of, the, of, of the previous mosque um, who helped to, to rebuild it, but also we were able to introduce new things like you know, modifying the, the materials and the clay and all that and having natural additives in them that will allow them to last longer and not need as much maintenance in order to just really stay as pristine as possible for as long as possible. This is actually when they were um, rebuilding the facade which had kind of melted away and then using just as many of um, local um, resources as we needed whether it's for light, light fixtures you know or whatever um, and using these these masons also as teachers you know for us for example when we were trying to build these these domes for the mosque we actually this in red is actually our our, our contractor and we he was not able to build them and we just struggled for days and days and days and we were just thinking the project is condemned, we're gonna have to change the, um, the whole approach because they were making all these formwork you know, and all that and it just was not looking right. And this mason um, was just watching us. He was working on resurfacing the old mosque and he was just watching us you know, in the kind of this condescending way. And so I called him over and I was like, do you know how to do this? And he was like, yeah, of course. I don't know what you guys are doing, but yes, I know how to do it. I was like, well, okay, well, can you make one of them? And, you know, and let's see. And he called over two of his other um, masons. They just had a string. They got on top of our beams, and then they just started laying one brick at a time, one brick at a time by hand, and then made these perfect, you know, um, objects. And just had it all done, and this was the result. And so, the whole process was just really this give and take, this, this learning you know, uh, experience, this exchange, both from us in terms of the things that we can add, in terms of, for making the construction techniques better, the, 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 um, for reinforcing the, um, uh, what do you call it, um, the materials, et cetera, and then for them in everything that they could teach us um, in terms of the construction techniques that they were aware of. And so that ended up being um, the result of um, basically more of an inclusive um, space where instead of having these two projects, we turned it into one project where we broke down the wall. And what we, what we were really interested in was having a space where religion and secular knowledge didn't have to be do, two things that are kind of against one another, which is becoming the case you know, too often and all over the world. It's not just a Muslim problem, it's not just, it's everywhere. Where it just seems like the two are 
could not be synonymous. And so what we were trying to say through this project was that actually this is a completely benign and non-problematic relationship where you can be in the library studying and then when it's prayer time, since you have to pray five times a day, you just walk on over to the mosque and then back to the library again. And so in that kind of simple gesture, just actually help break down this divide between the two by just making it this effortless and just non-issue type of way of dealing with these two different aspects of your life. So I had one more project to show, but I ran out of time. So I won't show it and I'll just <laughs> stop there and you know, maybe there'll be some other opportunity at another time. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for having us. It's a real honor uh, and a privilege to be uh, asked to speak here today. So the work of our studio emerges from an understanding that the sites, landscape, and the context that we work within are inherently charged with history and meaning, and that this meaning is entirely dependent upon the group or the individual that, have, that is responding to it. Um, so what I'm talking about is not a genius loci, that, that the, there is any kind of inherent meaning in the physical, you know, cellular structure of a place. It's that we are human beings, we're culturally loaded, historically loaded um, human beings, and we project continuously onto our environments. Um, and the overlapping nature of that um, cultural projection is absolutely based on our, um, our historical, our familial, and our cultural background, um, all of which kind of overlaps into this palimpsest of, of how we understand landscape. <coughs> Um, and we understand our role as architects is inherently a political one in that we need to understand the multiplicity of gazes or mul multiplicities of viewpoints on any, um, any landscape that we work in uh, because it's inherently charged. Um, the image behind me, oh sorry, um, the image behind me hangs on the wall of our studio. Uh, so within this sublime landscape, two elements that act as modifiers to how the image might be understood um, the winding road and the cars, and the short text not to be reproduced. Um, the the images are it's from a page from a book, Mirrors and Others, by artist Andreas Schultz, which is a collection of images uh, harvested from the Louvre uh, Gallery in Paris, associated with written text, which is has absolutely nothing to do, has no relationships to the images. They're completely random in their association. Uh, and what we love and what's important to us and to hang this in our studio is that it continuously talks about, um, I guess, this role of sight and modifier or conditioning object, um, in which is how we see architecture in its place in the landscape or has a capacity to be uh, um, a modifier in a place which is, has layers and layers and layers of narrative attached to it, depending, again, upon the viewpoint of the, you know, the person or the gaze. Um, so moving through, examples of this are in Paul Virilio's documentation of um, bunkers on the Western Front um, left over from you know, the World War II. These, um, these are all islands in the sites. They're all conditioning objects and you know, that modify the site. They have a, um, quite a strong relationship. However, with the degrees of separation, both geographically and temporally over time, the, the charge nature of that relationship starts to slip and the knowledge or the understanding of what those things mean starts to change and we start to emerge to these are images by a Swiss photographer, Martin Lindsay, documenting infrastructure in the landscapes of Switzerland, um, which are physically, structurally very, very similar, this kind of brutalist concrete architecture um, having an adjacency um, and, a, and an overlapping narrative with the landscape. Um, however, that, that narrative is quite different. I mean, uh, in some sense, this image in particular speaks of a futurist or Ballardian kind of almost sexual lust for adventure and speed, um, you know, taming a primitive landscape, though in our climate of climate change, uh, you know, the kind of current climate we're in at the moment, there's uh, perhaps more of a pathos of um, technology shifting and getting out of our control. Um, this brings us to an, uh, images of an Australian context, an Australian landscape. Um, these images are incredibly banal and familiar to Aaron and I. It's uh, places we've, uh, very familiar to us, places we've hung out and spent time with as, as kids and adults. Um, 
However, these two photographs were taken in the Belangolo State Forest in um, New South Wales, which were the site of uh, a, a spate of serial killings um, by a person, Ivan Milat, in the late 80s, early 90s in Australia. Um, and they speak of, without that knowledge, these are banal images. They're just another every space. However, with that inherent knowledge or the understanding of uh, these actions, they become sites of trauma. Um, bringing us to another, again, seemingly banal image, um, Warrigal Creek. Um, this was the site of a massacre, um, one of many massacres in Australia's history of Indigenous peoples, um, where between 60 and 150 Gunakurnai people were slaughtered, um, which takes us to Mile Creek, another, uh, another massacre site in Australia. Um, so Australia has a really deeply unresolved history, um, the dispossession of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia's colonisation has been profoundly unresolved in that we haven't gone through an appropriate reconciliation process or an appropriate truth-telling process to understand the changes or the, you know, the grotesque uh, events that have happened in, I guess, the formation of the contemporary Australian state that we live in. So this map here represents massacre sites that are recorded, that are known across Australia. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the yellow circles representing between six and 10 deaths in each event, and the, the brown circles representing more than 20 in each single event. Um, the $2 coin that we all have in our pockets on one side has the face of Queen Elizabeth II. On the other side has the face of um, uh, Gorai, oh sorry, <laughs> um, Gorai Jonarai, who was a um, Walpuri man from New, uh, Nor Northern Territory. Now, he was the, one of the sole survivors of the Canista massacre, one of the last recorded massacres in Australia. However, that was not the purpose, that was not the reason he was on the coin, it wasn't a memorial to that event. It was, he was, um, I suppose the image was a subjugation of the ideal native form, um, so in a, cult, a, a form of cultural appropriation, um, which is, uh, I think, profoundly shocking because not many Australians actually know the actual, the real history in terms of his uh, survival in that massacre event. Um, which comes to, this is a friend of ours, an art, Aboriginal artist, Daniel Boyd, um, it's a representation of the memorial of uh, the death of Captain Cook. Um, and here's a, a representation of that, of his murder or of his killing um, in Hawaii. Um, so Daniel um, has his early work, his early painting work, um, was trying to recontest the colonial gaze um, and reposition it from a colonised gaze. So um, controlling that narrative. Um, so this is one of his paintings. And on the right, you can see the original example uh, by Sir Joseph, or a painting by Benjamin West um, of Sir Joseph Banks. And Daniel's appropriation of this is on the left. Slightly changed with his own face and uh, in a jar in the bottom left corner of the painting. And again, a series of paintings where he's repurposed the colonial gaze um, and reconditioned as the colonised gaze. Um, probably should move much faster here. What we don't have in Australia, this is an example of the Altes Museum in Berlin, which is a physicalised manifestation of the you know, uh, traumatic moments that have happened in that history. The Neuss Museum in uh, Berlin, re, um, I, I guess reborn by David Schifferfield's um, adaptation there. Um, the Jewish Museum uh, with the Shalaket artwork um, and Daniel Lieberskin's Memorial to the Murder Jews of U Europe. These are all memorials that speak of these uh, past events in the history of Europe and in Berlin and Germany, um, all of which we don't have in Australia. We haven't come to terms with that and we don't have physicalised um, versions yet. We, we are starting to in the last couple of years only. Um, I'll very briefly pass through this, this is some artwork of my own, uh, which speaks of the settler history um, acting as a, an agent of that uh, dispossession of indigenous peoples of Australia. 
and the work manifests in a series of phys physical forms, each one going through a state of trauma um, to form the next work in the series, um, leaving the next piece made um, with the scars and the echoes and the shadows permanently etched within it of the piece before it. Um, having set an understanding of how we view landscape um, and uh, in, in this context and this notion of the cultural gaze linked to multiple and layered readings of place in Australia, we move on to how our practice has then engaged with making architecture within these conditions and later to two examples of how this has manifested in projects with a political, cultural and social focus. We often speak of sites and modifiers and understanding that an object or a building, um, people and the landscape they sit within all modify our perceptions and sometimes physical manifestations of one another. From the beginning, our practice began to catalogue our projects in a particular way, to speak to a sharp singularity of each project, a model, a drawing and a site portrait, all seen as essential to understanding the core essence or singularity of the project. Each model is produced to enable a reading of the building which cannot necessarily be best translated by a render or a plan or a section. It is more an immutable, tangible sense of the real. We believe architecture is about a bodily reaction, a bodily experience that is spatial and volumetric. Our models aim to capture this link, capture this and link to the conceptual framework of the building and its relationship to the site and to ourselves. The models allow a sense of uncanny or the foreign object which for us raises questions about its relationships in ways we feel typical architectural models could not enable. We believe that these raw elements, particularly the physical totem-like models, allow greater access to understanding a more complex and layered narrative rather than a self-evident nature. They're produced to prompt a questioning, they're objects in the round and have a presence which is unlike other models of representation. The different modes of representation aim to capture particular aspects, uh, uh, be it volumetric or a broader narrative. Landscapes are photographed in a way to capture an essential quality in a singular image. We aim to create buildings which are both sympathetic and dissonant to its context and inhabitants, a dual contradictory state whereby the architecture is seen externally as other, as having an uncanny quality which we believe opens a fissure between our expectations and understandings of what the architecture could be and allows a questioning of its inherent qualities and in doing so, a question of its relationship to place and to ourselves. This is not a didactic scenario. As discussed earlier, we all come to a situation with a different cultural gaze. Within this gaze, however, the uncanny, the foreign, promotes a questioning of the relationships. And in doing so, the potential to reveal old or new narratives and motivations. In the same way, the buildings are entirely sympathetic to the landscape and its inhabitants with a heightened experiential nature linked to the particular qualities of that place and, and an application of the particular brief. The notion of the other or the foreign, we believe, allows the architecture to be translatable across cultural boundaries and across underlying meanings to be, question underlying meanings to be questioned in relation to broader thematics beyond the core brief of the architecture. Our recent winning entry for the 2019 National Gallery of Victoria um, Pavilion to be built this November runs to the very core of this Australian condition. It seeks to shine a very public light on the fact that um, the fact Australia was found on a false claim of terra nullius. So terra nullius was basically the idea that there was no indigenous um, agriculture, industry or um, solid settlement that, that, that the indigenous people were um, basically uh, nomadic. And under that presumption, um, Australia was colonised and the sheep and the livestock came in and destroyed much of the evidence of a, of a very civilised um, nation that was thousands of years old. The pavilion that we... Um, ended up designing with artist Johannes Gass 
aims to represent this and this in this um, agriculture, this in this um, industry and this architecture, and it aims to bring about um, a a questioning of um, how Australia sees itself in many ways. This is some of Yuhani's previous works, which feature in the project. So um, set up on an axial pathway through the gallery proper, the pavilion split into two halves, a void in the middle representing the notion of terra nullius, and two, the two halves in the centre full of this idea of the smoking tree where eels were were um, basically smoked out in, 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 in large old gum trees and Johannes glass yams, which um, yams were a part of the uh, agricultural um, product that um, the indigenous peoples farmed, seeping out of the walls and uh, I guess reflecting in nature of um, this, this sort of, um, these narratives which have been uh, resilient over time and gradually pulling through into this um, pavilion and representing many of those old stories. We see this, um, these spaces as a, as, a, as a series of spaces to, for um, program, so for Indigenous um, elders to come in and start to tell the stories of these, um, these productions, the, the agriculture and the architecture and the industry, and so that those stories uh, live on and, are, are, and the, the, this myth and lie of Terra Nullius is exposed. Um, so quite pointedly, in, term, in collaborating with uh, Indigenous artist Ioanni Scares, that previous project and this next one that's on the screen now, uh, physicalised manifestations, they're you know, architectural memorials that allow um, an engagement with the content, I suppose, that needs to be addressed in Australia, which, um, as Aaron described, a lot of the, uh, almost entirely all of the physical history of 60,000 plus years of Indigenous settlement across Australia has been destroyed in the act of, um, you know, um, uh, the colonisation of Australia. Um, and there's little apparatus available um, to communicate those stories. Uh, so this pavilion in front of us is actually one that was opened just yesterday. It was a collaboration with artist Daniel Boyd, um, whose paintings we showed previously. And it's an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander War Memorial, um, the first of its kind commissioned by the federal government of Australia to represent uh, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander um, servicemen and women but it represents all conflict that they've fought for pre- and post-colonisation um, and is the first of its kind in Australia and it's a profoundly meaningful um, project uh, for many, many, many communities, many, many, many people in Australia. Um, the, the surface in front of us that we see is a 10 metre wide two-way mirror glass screen which is, uh, has a, a matte black ceramic frit um, over the top of it, allowing this pattern, this kind of point cloud, pointless pattern to appear. And it reflects the landscape you're, um, you know, that is behind you and it reflects yourself and the people gathering in front of the screen. And it creates a, it, it others you, it creates a, a, a fracture or a moment of um, temporal dissonance, I suppose, where you're inside the screen, you're not simply seeing yourself in a reflection, you're seeing yourself othered. Um, so it creates a portal of a kind to allow for um, a very specific kind of memorial where um, it's not, there is no description on how you're meant to respond to this work. Um, it's, it sets up a trigger or a facilitator with re responding to yourself as other um, in both time and place. Um, uh, the basalt, the basalt stone field in the foreground um, represents basalt was a material used to make axes and spearheads for again um, the oldest recording, 60,000 years old. Um, at the centre of the work is a. This is from the other side, the inside of a, the rammed earth structure, the earth being kind of swept up to nurture and protect you, to create an um, interior sanctum within the memorial where you look out through a point cloud of 10,000 windows back out onto that landscape you were just in. Um, this is Daniel Boyd, the artist that we collaborated with on the work. 
and in This Is The Diggers just yesterday walking through it for the first time um, and the light at dawn as it penetrates into the centre of the space, uh, so this immersive space of reflection. But in the centre of the memorial um, is a cast bronze earth vessel which goes down five metres into the ground and it's a, it's a sealed ceremonial chamber that um, on invitation, inv elders from indigenous and Torres Strait Islander communities around Australia are invited to come to the War Memorial and bring their, their earth, their country, the soil from their grounds, which is a profoundly meaningful element. Um, you know, dancers for millennia um, have been used to dance up the dust of ancestors, the grounds, um, that where they belong, where they come from. So these earths uh, and this soil has been brought together um, uh, as a very potent um, element to bring together the history of Australia um, in this place. Um, and I guess the, the lens is, in a sense, obfuscate. They obfuscate time and place. It allows you to temporarily connect to um, you know, who and what and when you need to um, connect with in a, site, in a space of a memorialization, but it also transfigures race. Um, it allows everyone to be reflected um, and blurred as equal, their bodies in that space, they're, they're not gendered, they're not racialized. Um, they become you know, simultaneously equal. So it's a, um, a, a way of both, um, you know, a, a profound vehicle we hope for the communities that it represents. Um, but it's also hopefully um, another physical manifestation, manifestation, another piece of architecture that acts as a site for knowledge sharing and storytelling and cross-cultural engagement in Australia. In a way, it goes to that idea of the cultural gaze and that multiplicity of cultural gaze. And yes, um, the point cloud um, that we see is that every single one of these lenses, these viewpoints, these dots of mirror, uh, represent the, the, you know, the, the, the thousand million uh, uh, you know, views or gazes from in, uh, every individual cultural perspective. Um, and that, um, I guess, is to works only um, uh, across the, the spectrum of works that we, involve with our, we are involved with in our practice, but two very important works to us um, that we hope is a starting point for many, many more pieces that are engaging, um, I, I guess, with this kind of cultural or political content in Australia. Um, thank you for having us. Thank you for this uh, couple of fantastic uh, talks. I actually had prepared several questions that uh, you um, already answered all of them. <laughs> so I was trying to reframe my questions because you clearly answered to the, to the topic of the panel and it, that was quite obvious. And uh, so for me, what, what has been uh, really interesting listening to you uh, today is the relation um, with conflict. I was, I initially I was going to ask directly about your political agenda, the political agenda behind the practice, and I think that that's quite obvious. But for me also, what it has been interesting that I already read in some of your articles is, and looking at your project, is actually that that political agenda is deeply related with the context, with the specific context. So you both are aware of uh, the values of the local, and, um, but you, Oh, both uh, work with uh, the, the idea of transgression. In your case, for instance, the, con the transgression of a program, clearly, or even transgression of, uh, of, of construction's methods. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, the idea of, of transgression is quite interesting because you, at the end of the day, that political agenda is understanding that um, somehow to be political means also to accept, to the conflict. So you're aware of the reality and uh, you're aware that that reality is somehow has to answer to uh, change for the, um, in order to answer to contemporary needs. And uh, those transgressions inevitably produce conflicts. Um, and the idea of conflict in both practices is quite different. For instance, in your case, is the, the need of physicality of a, a, fo a former conflict. And in your case, actually you're facing conflict because through your project you are generating conflict. So my question is, how do you deal with the idea of conflict? And uh, I think that it's quite important uh, to think about conflict nowadays, uh, mainly because we come from a tradition that we understand architecture as in a po quite positive manner. 
So we, we have been trained that architects, we mainly solve problems. But nowadays, we are facing the fact that we can generate problems. And that not necessarily is negative. So how you deal with conflict in your own practices? Um, it's interesting, actually, this notion that by doing the things that we do and tackling the issues that we do, we can potentially create conflict. I actually never looked at it that way. Um, because I think also, yes, there is conflict um, inherent to the context in that there are just always these dichotomies in places um, like Niger or Australia, you know, places that have known um, the trauma of colonization, that have known a certain amount of exploitation and, you know, and a certain subjugation and all of those things. Um, when you fast forward to the 21st century or even the 20th century, it's automatic conflict in the sense that there are, these are places that have been impacted by history where certain things were imposed on those places um, that are completely disconnected with that place. So then now um, the, the idea or the, the thought for, for me is, well, how do we actually reconcile? How do we make an additional bridge where you know, these are all places where something was interrupted at some point and something was put in its place. And so now I think there's a lot of thinking um, happening around how do we actually unearth all everything that was forgotten or conveniently kind of pushed under the rug, confront it, and then, you know, move forward with it. And so in the end, you know, the conflict is not so much about, I mean, the, the idea for me is not so much about creating conflict through the work, but more so um, about actually um, having a dialogue that changes the way that we approach things or view things, but make it be acceptable. Because I think conflict for conflict's sake, at the end of the day, is not very productive. So I'm really interested in well, how can, if we're thinking something, and if we're thinking, well, this is wrong, or we should do things differently, it's much more interesting for me to think of, how can I bring you to my side? Like, how can we share this idea um, and both agree that it's better to move in this other direction? And then and ev would everybody adopting, you know, this kind of other option, essentially? Um. Uh, yeah, from Australia, in, a, in an Australian context, we, um, sorry, let me know if I'm speaking properly into the microphone. Um, conflict is quite required. We have um, a very particular form of uh, amnesia, or there's an Australian myopia in terms of our history, in that um, the, the, you know, the atrocious events, the atrocities that have happened in the colonization on, in Australia and the dispossession of the First Nations peoples, have been eradicated from our history and they haven't been dealt with. So conflict is required in, in the sense of um, truth-telling and telling those stories and allowing those, those events to happen. The current population or the indigenous population is about 2% of Australia and they're almost entirely locked out of the contemporary condition um, through an enormous amount of um, um, yeah, uh, social, um, yeah, social bridges that aren't available to them and a huge amount of them come from uh, I, you know I mean there, there are so many political and social agendas at play but a large amount of that is the the, the unresolved story uh, around, around the birth and the trauma of this country that is um, unable to be spoken publicly um, and we need uh, opportunities uh, as many opportunities for those things to come forward and to be resolved so we can you know actually move together as a whole country instead of a broken one. Mm. And I think mm. we see it as a, as a quite a positive step forward, being able to, um, I think it's a positive thing to be able to try and bring together the dialogue and, and try and spread that dialogue as, as far as we can. But I think there's also, as architects, I think we, we need tools ourselves in Australia to enable us to understand how to deal with that landscape in that I would argue that we're quite conflicted about the way that we would deal with it or understand it. And it's not just, for Kim and I, we're obviously very interested in the indigenous um, side of things, but Australia actually has a, has a very um, diverse ethnic 
um, mix and um, we're interested in um, the stories and and I guess I guess this different cultural gaze across all sorts of both historical and contemporary conditions and I think if we can um, start to think about how architecture might um, start to either try and engage with those multiple narratives or or um, uh, begin a, a sort of process of um, dialoguing with them, I, I think it will make for a much richer um, experience of architecture and I think it will lead to a more meaningful architecture that can um, live, uh, I guess, pass on some of those, um, those lessons that we learn by engaging with them. I was also curious to, um, to listen um, a bit more about uh, politics with um, uh, big P, so <laughs> capital P. And uh, because I, you know, I come from a city, Barcelona, that uh, when architects were uh, directly involved uh, with uh, political institutions or public institutions, um, the city changed uh, radically. Mm -hmm. And you can see that that happened during the transition after our dictatorship years, and it stopped after the Olympics. And nowadays, after the 2008 uh, economical crisis, it seems that architects are more involved uh, with public institutions directly. So my question is, in both of your contexts, um, how architects or um, architectural practices are engaged directly with uh, public institutions, if that is the case, uh, or if not, which kind of relation do you have? Um, I think fundamentally architects need to be advocates for a, um, in a, com in a, you know, a, a grand a public conversation. Um, buildings that exist in that built environment have, I mean, um, they are engaged with in a very particular way. And I think it's um, incredibly unfortunate if we don't use that opportunity to have a voice and to, to speak out across um, an incredibly wide range of issues that need to be discussed and engaged with constantly in our, you know, on our ongoing uh, <coughs> contemporary condition. Um, you know, this engages, this, you know, it speaks to, you know, um, uh, class, inequality, wealth, gender, race, all of these things, uh, all of these things architecture has a capacity to deal with every single day. And I think it's our, you know, um, because of the leverage from a single body to you know these last large ve uh, buildings that have you know they act as vehicles for um, a level of exchange beyond ourselves, I think we um, and forums like this you know then we have a, I guess an obligation to engage with those battles. In many ways, is is it, I think you could argue that arch like any act of architecture is somewhat political in a way, like in the in the way that you think about planning, in the way that you think about how where particular uses of rooms go in terms of how a building might relate to uh, the urban environment, how it relates to a particular, to gender or to, to a particular minority group or whatever it might be, um, or even just like how, how things are planned for safety or whatever it might be. Like, I think you know, the, the act of making architecture is no, true, but for political. instance in Melbourne now there's, uh, you have um, seen that it's quite similar to what's going on here in Manhattan with mm -hmm. these new real estate developments yeah. of luxury housing that at the end, uh, there are international investments. Mm -hmm. They're changing radically mm -hmm. the way the city, not only the way the city is shaped, but also mm -hmm. the, the political capacity of inhabitants mm -hmm. because we are draining the city from inhabitants as uh, those buildings are not actually inhabited. Yeah, so architects are complicit in that. So my question <laughs> about it's it's directly, it's yeah. how do you answer to that? We also, it's, um, we, we have such limited tools, you know, we, we have, uh, on one hand we have such great power and on the other hand, the, um, the, the current housing that you're talking about, I guess the, the rampant amount of um, apartment buildings going up in Melbourne in the last decade, uh, what you're, which is what you're referring to, all stems from cap big P politics which is the, uh, I guess, the corruption, the connection between um, generally state, federal politicians and developers uh, having um, too close a connection to the planning laws which allow a massive amount of um, apartments to go, that make a huge amount of short-term profit and leave terrible long-term housing opportunities for generations to come. Um, unfortunately, that's not a, 
that's not default of architects, that's beyond architects, that's within planning and government. Um, however, that needs to be, we're witnesses to this, so we need to see it, and we need to, we need to kind of, um, you know, try and change those conditions. I mean, there, there are small steps where that's happening in Melbourne. There's kind of um, bow grip and style projects, but that's, again, it's a very, very, it's like a single grain of sand against a much bigger fight. You really, to, to change, to have that kind of change at a greater scale that's required, you need to step outside of that architectural role, the single building, um, you know, the fight per single building. You actually need to go back and change the levers which control thousands of buildings being built um, to allow opportunities for houses or housing that are, that are built by designers and are built according to planning codes that see all of the different people that live in them, all of the different ranges of requirements. Again, um, making sure the cultural gaze is understood of the, the population that matters so that buildings are designed um, to um, accept and promote um, diversity um, and from diversity of viewpoints and requirements. In your I, think, I think you need also architects to act, act as a group, uh, act as a, as a um, come together in a way, because if it's just singular voices, we, you know, we, we, what do we design 5% of buildings in the world, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, so we need, we need to come together and, and yep. get a bit more of an authority on, on the voice. I think like, of any profession, we've been able to marginalise uh, marginalize ourselves so well. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, I completely agree because I think also we have to be very careful and not, you know, I think as an architect we like to be very heroic. Um, we have to be careful also to understand that to, we are not the answer to everything. And so not everything is an architectural problem. You know, this particular example is not an architectural problem. However, it doesn't mean that we don't have a contribution that we can make in terms of certain decisions that we make. Yeah. One, one building cannot solve, you know, like one housing project cannot solve all housing problems. Mm -hmm. However, there are certain, you know, small steps that we can do in every, any given project that actually, you know, can make a contribution. So I think also that's, it, it, what, what, what's helpful also often is to, to um, in, in my view, um, remember that even if you cannot impact the global, you know, view of things, there are still it's not it's not a zero sum game, right? There are still certain steps that you can take in certain types of projects, you know. And small projects um, do make, make a difference. Like exactly. yours have made a difference. It's like, they, because they, then they it's then, about mindsets, yeah, right? Like you can use dialogue. projects, yeah, and yeah. push forward a certain idea mm. that can actually work towards inception. So per perhaps <laughs> the power <laughs> is, is not necessarily then, like the, like a, a, a sort of, it's like just the dialogue com that comes around exactly. a small project can live exactly. on and, and, and actually and move things forward. Yeah, like exactly. I, I can, but then at the, end of the, at the end of the day, you're answering to my questions. They're not architects involved in, in capital P mm. politics. Mm -hmm. So we need to like get out there and become politicians. Well, actually, I think we, Maybe we, we need to, to take a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I do agree that actually we do have to take position. Like I think at this point, you know, in this century, um, those days of just kind of being in our little ivory tower, you know, like in our little world, you know, um, should be over, honestly. We have too many problems, we, there are too many challenges, and there's really, None of us actually get to just do our own thing, you know, I feel. I feel like we just, you know, either by being vocal, by, you know, injecting that in our architecture, by talking about it, you know, but every, I feel like as architects, we have the responsibility, as you were saying, to actually take position. We have we to have we do, a position. We do, we do do a lot of talking, though, don't we, as architects? We, we like, do, we we do a lot that. of speculation, <laughs> we do we a lot of that. writing, <laughs> but we probably, you know, like maybe it's like we that. We that. need activists. Yeah, architects. exactly. So, like, we, yeah. it's the things that we say, you know, it's, <laughs> we have to take position. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you have taken position quite mm. well. So mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to open the conversation here. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of questions. Yeah, I, th <clears throat> um, I think the discussion uh, about the relation between architects and politicians is very interesting, but um, politicians have a certain agenda and they're there for a certain period of time, right? Mm -hmm. And we're like professionals and we're there all the time. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that when you talk about urban planning, I like, I'm from the Netherlands and there's a very strong urban planning apparatus mm -hmm. and there's very strong control over cities, etc. But still, the people that are in their positions, they're there just for three or four years. It's sometimes not enough time to oversee the problematics for the longer period. So what you're just saying about, for example, the housing, I know that in, for example, Amsterdam, there's a huge problem with these developer projects. 
and uh, they're actually architects that made the city aware of the long-term effects of these kind of projects. And then the city took action and say, you can only buy a housing project if you're gonna live there yourself now. So they put rules in place because architects notified them. Mm -hmm. And I think it is, um, maybe you cannot solve problems with one project, but just being there and being an expert in your own profession, I think it's a very good place to give advice. Yeah, to people. Absolutely. Yeah, in Australia, the, the Institute of Architects are getting, like seemingly getting a, generating a, a larger voice as a, as a group, as a body, and, and like we may not see it a great deal kind of overtly, but in, in behind the scenes, they are as a group um, shaping policy all the time and trying to kind of improve policy around a lot of these issues that particularly to do with housing or, or, um, or planning or urban design, whatever it might be. But um, yeah, I agree. Like I think long long term strategic planning that's associated with Planning regulations, pretty, pretty powerful, pretty important. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say thank you, guys. It was a really great talk. Um, so much of what you discussed uh, is a like, questioning of the places of your homes, and in a particular political, social, and historical context. Um, how would you apply the same principles within context of an unfamiliar location? And I guess kind of backtracking a bit, um, as architects, do you think it's possible to create genuine, genuine, meaningful, and effective spaces within spaces that you don't necessarily have meaning, carry meaning for you? Yeah, you just research? Yeah, exactly. Talk to people? Talk exactly, to the, yeah. research. Yeah. Just, I mean, ruthless, deep, really involved mm. research. There's really no way around it. But that's, you know, I think even whether you're familiar with the context or not, you have to go through that. I think know, that's actually, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? To like find out what the problems yeah. are or the kind of like exactly, issues. Exactly, like the history, the, you know, like all those place. layers, yeah. you know. And it's like, because I think may maybe, you know, the reason why we're even having to have this discussion is because we've been, you know, really concerned with architecture in terms of form instead of aesthetics, you know, and, and all of those things. But really, like, we're doing architecture for people to inhabit. So you fundamentally, might, yeah. I mean, you might need to collaborate with somebody that's local because I, I mean, yeah. I think as an outsider, like we've got a particular. As we, Kim and I were talking about this idea of cultural mm. gaze. Like we would come into a place and, and we would think that we would know what was happening. Yeah. Even by talking to people, we might think we might know that that. that. But in reality, that the, you know, the way that they see things, the way that local architects see things, or local people involved in issues, um, we can't we can't impregnate that cultural gaze. I think so. Um, I think collaboration is is. Uh, a big um, important tool there. I think it's uh, I think it's um, a really good question, and it's a really complex answer. The answer is both yes, maybe no, all of yes. all, and all of the above. Sometimes um, no, often no. <laughs> where the, within a twenty-minute framework, the talk that we gave specifically went down the path of indigeneity in Australia and the gays, um, the, I guess the white colonized gays and uh, the gays of. Um, First Nations people in Australia, but that's not the entire that's not the entire population of Australia. We have a really diverse, uh, multicultural population, each of which has its own. Um, you know, I'm I'm a white, educated, cisgendered man. You know, I have I'm I've got that slim uh, set of things that kind of represents me or defines me, and everyone else has, uh, you know, uh, their myriad different uh, positions on that spectrum. Um, and you can't consult with everybody. It's not possible, um, and not every. And so, no one's fully representative of their communities. Um, I think there's something absolutely interesting about architecture. At least having an understanding that there's. Well, you know, I guess as architects, we come from a perspective where no matter what building we do, uh, be it a single private house for a client or a cultural building or a gallery. We know that it's in a position where it's understood from a diversity of viewpoints, and we go in knowing that. But we certainly don't go in knowing the answers of what that is. We certainly don't go in knowing what that's meant to mean to anybody. But we know that it will um, be in this kind of overlapping narrative spectrum. And that goes to that, that what we're talking about in terms of this idea of the uncanny, or the, or the, the, the sort of foreign object in a landscape, or wherever it might be. And that, that, that uncanny or, or foreign object uh, opens up the possibility of questioning, questioning its relationship with place and, or its relationship with the people of that place or uh, the inhabitants of the building. And it allows the questioning of what it means to be there and what people overlay onto it. Yeah. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that you know often this notion of you know doing architecture in a place that you're unfamiliar with, you know 
often is unnecessary. Um, <laughs> because I, th I think the first step is always actually questioning the motives behind behind that, you know, the motives behind, you know, exporting yourself to a different place, you know, and um, that's something that is certainly in Africa we struggle with a lot, you know, in terms of um, architects from elsewhere um, doing projects in Africa and in African countries, for example. Um, it's, it's, you know, depending on the project, it's not always appropriate. And you, you don't always have any business going out, you know, somewhere else. You know, um, collaboration would have to, you know, it's, it's definitely key, but maybe you actually, you know, it's a no. Like there's, you actually have no business being there and it's fine, like, stay in your court. <laughs> One more question. If not, Is maybe everything? we close it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have many. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I, actually, it's a bit related with what you were saying about the courtyard, um, because somehow you both have um, an outsider point of view. In your case, it comes from the art world. You have been always interested in the art world, and that that allows you to go away a bit of your own uh, context, uh, the disciplinary context in your case. And, and in, in your case, it's actually the fact that I, I was not even aware that you're like actually half of the year here, half of the year there, which are the values of being detached. Yesterday, I was actually um, talking to my students because now I'm reading um, uh, Retif de la Breton, who is an, um, a writer from the uh, 18th century. Um, um, and he writes about Paris and about the, the, all the, uh, the ambience of the city uh, right before the revolution. It's really interesting. He was a fetishist, so you know this kind of not writings that you really enjoy. And uh, he actually wrote all those fantastic books for, about Paris outside of Paris. Mm -hmm. So he always needed to go outside in order to write. And then he came back for months to leave the city and then back again outside. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you use that capacity of being outsiders within your own? I think for me actually it's been it's it's very conflicting actually I'm very conflicted about um, having one one foot here one foot there. Um, I think the ideal would have been to just be based there, um, but regardless. I've lived outside of Niger for so long that I do have an outsider's um, look as well. And it's useful in many ways in that it allows, you know, kind of like to step back and actually allows me to appreciate all the things that are possible and that are available rather than, you know, like when, whenever you're in an environment for too long, you you lose the sight of the forest, right? Because you're in the, among the trees. So um, it, it's, it's very useful for being able to just step back and take stock and, actually even check myself, you know, even emotionally. And, you know, and, you know sometimes you get so involved um, in it, like you lose sight of the big picture. So it's really useful for that. But I would say that, um, I mean, I, I don't think it's necessary, but, but it does help you maybe have clarity faster, you know, and just in a more immediate way by being able to relate what you're working on to other things and see things a bit differently and see maybe opportunities that you wouldn't see otherwise. I think, um, I think quite crucially, architects need to be far more than just architects. Uh, I think being siloed and myopic within uh, an industry obsessed with itself um, is, you know, we have to be people, fully formed people first, and then architects second. I mean, you know, architecture should be the, the vehicle for being, you know, a human in the world. Um, in terms of our work, I, I think we, I think it's incredibly important to kind of oscillate between, you know, um, having an, an insider gaze and an outsider gaze. And I say that incredibly knowingly that I have a profoundly privileged position <laughs> from my <laughs> background, and you know, um, um, a huge amount of people in this world don't get that opportunity to slip to the insider side. They're only ever given the opportunity, um, or it's thrust upon them to be an outsider only. I'm going beyond the fact that probably is the way to to be creative or critical mm -hmm. with 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 one's context. I, I in, in both of your cases clearly have uh, it has been the way to start a practice. And uh, one of uh, one of the values of this um, um, conference is uh, to 
to visualize different uh, young practices worldwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you actually have in common is that thanks to the fact that you are a bit aside of a bit aside of, of the former discipline or a bit aside of your context, it actually has helped you to start the practice. Or do you agree or disagree? Because it's yeah, a it's totally assumption. To, yeah, it's allowed us to create a framework through which we can practice, through which we, we can enable um, work that feels meaningful to us. Uh, I think that's been important for us in terms of uh, a starting point. Otherwise, I, I mean, there, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any r right or wrong way to start a practice, but um, it's certainly uh, um, being outside of or, or being able to view um, architecture in the way that we've decided to view it or kind of come at it has has set that framework up. Um, I think. Uh, in, in some ways that, that, that sort of um, edge condition of being able to sort of see from, with, from outside of it, it, it helped set that up in that Kim and I probably were um, not like key in that. We kind of came at the Melbourne um, School of Architecture and so forth um, from regional spaces. And so we, we kind of probably were taught more in a phenomenological kind of way, um, or uh, yeah, and I guess we, we were sort of obsessed with critical regionalism for a while, and then we kind of came back around to a different way of thinking. Um, but I think going then through into a sort of more theoretical uh, university through RMIT kind of allowed a, a re-questioning of, of a lot of that stuff. But um, you might th feel different than Kim. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's just a personal journey. I, I think. Um, mm, yeah, I, I've been practicing as a visual artist for many years, and um, and the, the 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 ability to uh, you know um, manage ideas and use um, you know, communicate through ideas through you know, um, artwork as a facilitator for them as a medium for them, I think has been profoundly important for me in the way I think about architecture in how malleable they are and how malleable um, you know, knowledge and thought is and how it can be wielded and shifted. It's incredibly um, mercurial, you know, the way we can throw these things around. And so, um, you know, knowledge is a weapon you know, in that way. The way we talk about these things, the way we're framing debate uh, is very, very potent. Um, you know, it's certainly um, clarified the way that we, or you know, the way that I come to architecture, the way we come to architecture, um, in that it's, you know, it is an incredibly important thing, it is an incredibly powerful thing. Mm. I was also curious in the case of Marian, um, how is it perceived on site, the fact that you're an, a little bit an outsider? Actually, it, it hasn't really come as an issue, um, because I, I actually don't think I'm seen as an outsider. Um, or maybe sometimes if, if it's the case, it might be a plus, because there's also you know, the advantage of studying, you know, outside or, you know, having degrees from another country or from a Western country is seen positively. So maybe for that, actually, it makes my job a little easier in terms of credibility, in a way. So that's that's a little ironic. But, um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I think, because the thing is, you know, in the context in which I work and also the kinds of projects that we do, I'm actually an outsider by default. Because also a lot of the issues that we tackle, I come of, I come from a privileged you know point of view, right? So a lot of the issues that we, we tackle are from people who are far you know less privileged than than I am. So I'm an outsider from that point of view anyway, you know. So it's it's automatic. And when you the people you're working with, um, the people you're working for, you know, and I'm not talking about clients. I'm talking about users, the people that we communicate with, you know, and all that. But it, in in the end, it makes for a really like a very rich dialogue and a very rich back and forth that is very um, not only inspiring for the work that, that that we do, but it really allows us to have these just ongoing conversations for years and years and years with all kinds of people. It's it's amazing. Well, it's time to close the conversation. Thank you very much Thank you. Um, for those fantastic Thank lectures. You. Thank you. Thank you.